A couple years ago, I was in Kansas City, and it was my first debate against Bart Ehrman. How many of you have heard of Bart Ehrman? Wow, a lot of you. Um, Bart Ehrman, for those of you who haven't heard of him, is probably the most influential, skeptical New Testament scholar in North America. He teaches at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So I'm getting ready to debate him, and he and I are having dinner together beforehand with a few others. And one of the people we were having dinner with um, is the present offensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, he used to be the head coach for Georgia Tech. Um, I forgot his name, but it was a really, really uh, interesting dinner. And I was asking him all these questions, and I said, hey, hey, tell me, these guys that play football their whole careers, they have this whole career in the NFL, what are they like afterward? Are they in pain? He said, for the rest of their lives, they will be in pain. Everyone except maybe the kicker. And <laughs> I got thinking about that, you know, all the blows that they take, and you've got, even with all that equipment, you've got, you know, everything from head to toe, all this very expensive equipment you're wearing, and, and you wouldn't want to go without any of it, um, like the shoulder pads. Imagine playing organized football without shoulder pads. Uh, you know, all it could take is just one hit to put you out for the game, the season, maybe your career. Uh, it could really uh, hurt you. But of all the pieces of equipment that you would wear in organized football. The most important piece of equipment, of course, is the helmet. Now, this is an authentic Baltimore Ravens helmet. They run about $200, whatever team you get. Um, I got a Ravens helmet because I'm from Baltimore. Had I been from Dallas, this would be a Cowboy helmet because the Cowboys are a cool team. You know, if you live in Dallas and if you like high school football. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but so this is a, it, you, they're going to pay $200 for something like this, just like the pros wear on the field. And you've got all this kind of padding inside, and the helmet's made out of a special, very durable uh, plastic of some sort. And you're not going to cut costs on something like this because of everything that you wear on a football field. This is the most important. You take a good head blow, that could mean your life. So um, it's important that you do your best to protect your head on this. Well, that's when we talk about the physical realm. But what about when we talk about the intellectual and the spiritual realm? It seems that when we go off to college, we're liable to take a lot of head blows, aren't we? First day of class you walk in, I've been told this, I've spoken on over 50 campuses, I've been told by numerous students on other campuses, um, that the first day of class, the teacher said, the professor says, how many of you are Christians in this class? A few will raise their hand and say, my objective is by the end of this semester, you will no longer be a Christian. That happened at, at University of Georgia, near a couple hours from where I live. It's happened up at the University of Massachusetts. A few, uh, like a month and a half ago, they told me uh, at New Mexico State University, it's happening there. I've had it happen all over the country, students tell me. It's happening there. Now think about this for a moment. Imagine if on the first day of class that professor said, how many of you are Muslims? How many of you are Jews? How many of you are Hindus? That would never happen, would it? But it's open season on Christians. In 2007, there was a report that came out by two Jewish researchers, it's posted on the web, they interviewed um, over 1,300 American faculty from uh, just under 700 American universities. And they, fa they wanted to find out what were the, the religious sentiments of American faculty toward uh, religious followers. What they found is that there were 3% of the professors in the United States have negative or unfavorable feelings toward Jews. 22%, however, had negative and unfavorable feelings toward Muslims. The percentage that had negative and unfavorable feeling toward evangelical Christians, 53%. These two Jewish researchers went on to report that the majority of American faculty wanted it so they desired that Muslims would pay, play a greater role in American politics, but they didn't want evangelical Christians to have any whatsoever. 
any part in the American political process. They went on to say, this is very concerning to us. We don't understand why this is happening. They said, we, have, we can see where, uh, where American students, Christian students, are definitely, most certainly, being discriminated against because of their faith, as are Christian professors. They're getting denied tenure. They're not getting a fair shake when it comes to getting posts, teaching posts at the various schools. So what do we do about this? They said, we don't know. They said, one thing is for certain, though. The concern of Christian parents about sending their kids to uh, secular universities for fear that they will be discriminated against is well-founded. There's a lot of head blows that's happening. And a lot of those head blows are directed toward the Gospels, the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, Bart Ehrman, I've had the opportunity to debate him twice, and uh, nice guy, I like him. Um, in fact, you know, I would consider him a friend, he just has lousy arguments. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as we're, as in our debates, he, he goes and he attacks the Gospels, which was pretty irrelevant to our debate on the or debates on the resurrection. But nevertheless, a lot of Christians wanted responses to these. They wanted to know some of the answers to these objections that Ehrman's given. So are the Gospels trustworthy? I'm going to come in from the back door, and I'm going to do that by answering some of the major objections that are given by scholars today against the historical reliability of the Gospels. Um, I'm going to cite Ehrman, most of all, because he has popularized these objections. And he's one of the main people out there giving these objections. Uh, but these apply, uh, if you're out there sharing your faith at all and they're objecting to the Gospels, I am certain you've heard these. So let's talk about these. We're calling them the ABCs, Ds, and Es of defending the Gospels. Let's look at the A's, authorship. Now, Ehrman goes on to say, he says, the Gospels are forgeries. He says, what I mean by that is they claim to be authored by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but nobody believes in the academic community that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John actually penned these. He goes on to say that when you uh, look at the manuscripts, the original manuscripts of these Gospels did not contain the titles that we see on them today, the Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to Mark, Luke, and John. It's, okay. So what do we say about this? Well, first I would say that we really don't know if the originals had the titles because we don't have the originals and we haven't had them for some time. So Ehrman really can't say that these titles weren't in the originals at some point because he's never seen them. But what if the Gospels in the autographs, the originals, what if they didn't contain the titles? What if they were anonymous, which is Ehrman's complaint? Well, it's really no big deal. Plutarch, um, is the most prolific biographer in antiquity. He wrote probably 60 biographies. We really don't know how many exactly, but he wrote about 60, and we still have about four dozen of those that remain. So 48 is pretty good for his total number of biographies written on ancient figures. He's writing just after the turn of the second century, so within a couple of decades of when the Gospels were written. Um, you can purchase these. You can probably go online and see them. I've got my copies through the Harvard uh, Loeb Classical Library series. You can read the, the Greek that was used on one side, the English on the other. Um, and there's 10 volumes to fit in these 48 uh, biographies. I did a search, and would you like to know how many times Plutarch's name appears in the 48 biographies we still have? It never does. Well, how do we know Plutarch wrote it then? Well, because the tradition had been passed along by ancient writers who knew who wrote these. For example, someone might quote Plutarch, one of his biographies, and say, as Plutarch wrote in his life of Theseus, the legendary founder of, of Greece. So um, he, he, he would, they'll, they'll quote Plutarch, or they'll, they will attribute these biographies to him. Well, is it possible that all of these people were mistaken and that Plutarch didn't write them? Sure, anything's possible. But historians don't look for possibilities, they look for probabilities. And when you have the unanimous testimony that Plutarch wrote these, well, historians just don't really question it at that point any longer, and we accept that Plutarch wrote those. Well, if that works for secular authors, why wouldn't it work for Christian authors? 
So then what traditions, you might say, let's just assume for a moment that Ehrman is right and that none of the Gospels bear the titles on it that we have in our New Testaments today. Well, there are traditions that have been passed along from early Christians, the early church fathers, that attribute the Gospels to the traditional authorship that we see in our New Testaments. The first one to do this, um, the first one to do this is a guy named Papias. We really don't know when Papias wrote, the, kind of like the latest dates around 120. Uh, many scholars are now putting him in the first decade of the second century, so we could say, you know, like around 105 to 110. But I'm just going to take a, a, to be cautious, I'm going to take the later date, because um, the earlier the better. So let's just say the later. And Papias is the first one to report who wrote the Gospels. Papias says that John, or the beloved disciple, wrote, actually says John did, uh, wrote the, the gospel attributed to him. And um, we put that around the year 90. Um, now Papias wrote about somewhere between 15 and 30 years after that, because if John is writing around 90 and Papias is writing somewhere between 105 to 120, that's 15 to 30 years after John penned it. All right, and Papias is pretty close to John because Papias got his information from a guy named the Elder John, who was called the Elder John to distinguish him from the Apostle John, and the Elder John got his information from the Apostles. So this is only two removed and 15 to 30 years removed from when John wrote his Gospel. Now Papias tells us that Matthew, the tax collector, and one of Jesus' disciples wrote Matthew, Mark, he says, was not uh, an eyewitness, but he got his information directly from the Apostle Peter. So he's writing from the memoirs of Peter. And most scholars today grant that as well. They believe more than half of the scholars, including skeptical ones who write on this topic, say that Mark got his information from Peter. Even Elaine Pagels at Princeton says this. She acknowledges it. Um, the big question is, did he pen the Gospel of Mark while Peter was alive, or did he do it shortly after Peter died? That's really the only question that most scholars are still in heavy debate over when it comes to Mark. And then uh, Papias, like I said a moment ago, says that John, wrote the, who was the beloved disciple, wrote John's Gospel. Now, I didn't mention Luke, because Papias doesn't mention him. The authorship of Luke's Gospel comes just a little bit later through a guy named Justin who writes around the year 150. He's also known as Justin Martyr because he was later martyred for his faith. And he mentions how Luke was the physician by trade and that he was a traveling companion of Paul and that he got his information from the eyewitnesses. And if you turn to Luke's Gospel, the first four verses tell us that, about pretty much that, that Luke got his information from those who saw the Lord and who got the message from the Lord. So these are the first two guys who, in antiquity, who report, uh, give us reports concerning the authorship of the Gospels. That's where it comes from. And then we have several other Christians who mention it afterward. Um, and so that's where the traditional authorship of the Gospels come from. Now, is it possible that these guys, all these ancient authors, you know, Papias, um, Justin, and all the others who mention the authorship, is it possible that they're mistaken? Sure, anything's possible. But again, historians must go by probable, not just possible. And the unanimous testimony, it's unanimous, that Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, Luke wrote Luke, and John wrote John. So unless you can come up with some really, really strong arguments to the contrary, the traditional authorship is something that we should give serious consideration to. James D.G. Dunn, not necessarily an evangelical, uh, but one of the most prominent New Testament scholars in the world, just last year in his uh, large volume on the book of Acts and, and history, he writes, to be sure, two of the four canonical gospels have traditionally been attributed to two of the 12, Matthew and John, and the claim deserves respect. Now this is a guy who probably doesn't believe in these, the traditional authorship of the gospels. And Matthew and John, he mentions those because those two are the most hotly disputed the truth of the matter is, from those who have specialized in this, the majority of scholars, as I said a moment ago, believe that Mark wrote Mark and Luke wrote Luke. More than 50% of them do. 
The two that are most hotly disputed are Matthew and John. And here's Dunn saying that even when it comes to the traditional authorship of Matthew and John, the claim of the traditional authorship deserves respect. We talked about the ABCs, Ds, and E's. Let's look at B's, bias. Ehrman, and you've heard it yourself from many others, and they say, the gospel authors were biased. We shouldn't believe them. I remember my very first debate was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I debated a guy named Dan Barker, who used to be in the ministry, and he left, and he started the Freedom From Religion Foundation, wrote a book called Losing Faith in Faith. And so he's my first opponent, and we're up there, and he says, he, he says we shouldn't believe the Gospels because they're biased. In fact, the authors were not only biased, they were giving us propaganda. And he cites from the Gospel of John, who says, I have written these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he says, see, he's writing with this intention. He wants you to believe. So he's got this agenda, and so we should reject it because it's propaganda. So I turned to him and I said, well, um, Dan, you wrote this book called Losing Faith in Faith. You wrote this book so that we may not believe. You have an agenda behind it, so it's propaganda. Should we throw it out? Um, so there's some inconsistencies in the thinking. Let's look at some other books here. Or before we go, go to some other books, let's consider this. You watched the Super Bowl two years ago, and one of the very last plays of the game, I mean, the, the score is switching. It's going back and forth, back and forth. It's a tense game. Anyone could win it. Pittsburgh just scores with uh, about two minutes left to play. So now Phoenix is coming down the field. Kurt Warner, great quarterback, is going back to pass. There's like 17 seconds left. The best receiver in the NFL at that point is bolting down the field. Warner's going back to throw it to him, and this Pittsburgh Steeler comes out of nowhere, and the ball comes loose. Pittsburgh falls on it, and the Steelers win the Super Bowl. Now, it was very close, and in the NFL, there's this rule that if the hand was just slightly going forward when that ball comes out, it's an incomplete pass. But if the hand was stationary, it's a fumble. So you're watching the replays, and you're wondering what happened here. Was this a fumble? or was it an incomplete pass? The way you decided on it was largely dependent on whether you were pulling for Pittsburgh or Phoenix. <laughs> right? Bias impacts us all. It's not only in religious matters, it's also in sports, it's in politics, it's in, uh, anything that has to do with our race, our gender, our ethics, our nationality our philosophical, political, religious, moral, ethical uh, convictions, the way we were raised, the academic institutions we attended, the very group of people whose um, acceptance and respect we desire. Everybody's impacted by this. And this is, uh, this is, there's a consensus amongst professional historians who acknowledge this. So it's kind of like when er Ehrman says, well, the author, gospel authors were biased. You know, all of us who have studied philosophy of history and historical method, just kind of look at them and go, duh, who's not? We're all biased. Every last one of us in this room are, are biased. It's just that, so the issue isn't biased. The issue is our arguments. Do we have good arguments to support our view? Gert Ludemann is an atheist New Testament scholar, and in his book, The Resurrection of Christ in 2004, he writes, the aim of this book was to prove the non-historicity of the resurrection of Jesus and simultaneously to encourage Christians to change their faith accordingly. Did Ludem, was Ludeman biased? Did he have an agenda? Should we throw out his book because he had an agenda? No, no, come on, guys. <laughs> we throw it out because the content stinks, not because he's biased. Richard Dawkins, we want another militant atheist, a guy that's been weaned on a pickle. And in his book, <laughs> in his book, The God Delusion, Dawkins writes, if this book works as I intend, religious readers who open it will be atheists when they put it down. Is Dawkins biased? Does he have an agenda? Is this propaganda? You bet. Does that mean he's wrong? No. <laughs> His arguments are wrong, but just because he's biased doesn't mean he's wrong. 
Again, you can be biased, but right. What about historians, Jewish historians, as Craig Blomberg points out? What about Jewish historians who write on the Holocaust? Are they biased? Do you think there's a bit of propaganda in reporting the atrocities at Auschwitz and Dachau? Of course. Does it mean it's false, though? Propaganda can be good. Uh, some of you won't remember this commercial. I'm 49, but several years ago, there was this commercial that just had uh, some eggs, and it said, this is your brain. <laughs> All right, and then they cracked the eggs and put it in and show them frying and said, this is your brain on drugs. Was that propaganda? Was there an objective behind that commercial? Of course there was, to keep people from taking, or to discourage them from taking drugs. Was the commercial true? Of course. So just because it's, uh, uh, it's propaganda or has an objective doesn't mean it's wrong. C, contradictions. Ehrman says that the Gospels contradict themselves and so therefore they shouldn't be believed. In our debate, which was on the resurrection of Jesus, he says, look, we just can't trust them. They can't even agree amongst each other. Um, was Jesus crucified at, six, uh, at 9 a.m. or at noon? Depends which Gospel you read, he says. Um, did Jesus carry his cross all the way as John portrays, or did Simon of Cyrene help him as Matthew, Mark, and Luke portrays? It depends which gospel you read. Uh, when Jesus is crucified between two thieves, did both thieves curse him as Mark portrays? Or did one thief say to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, as Luke says? Depends which one you read. And when Jesus is uh, raised from the dead, and the women come to the tomb, how many angels were there? Was there one, like Matthew and Mark say, or were there two, like Luke and John say? Depends which one you read. And how many women went to the tomb? Was there just one, like Luke, um, John says, or were there multiple women, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke say? Depends which one you read. And did Jesus first appear to his disciples in Jerusalem, like Luke says, or was it in Galilee, like Matthew says? And did he appear on Easter, and all the appearances occur on Easter, and he rose, for, and then he ascends into heaven on Easter, like Luke says, or did it happen over a period of time like the rest of the Gospels portray? Now, some of you are thinking right now, oh my gosh, no wonder he doesn't believe. <laughs> I didn't know all those things existed, all those differences. Look, I, I didn't either. I really didn't pay much attention to them. And then I started doing my doctoral research and I decided one thing I needed to do was read through the burial and resurrection narratives in the Gospels 35 times in Greek. And that way it would really slow me down and concentrate on every single word and phrase that was used so I could read these carefully. And as I was doing that, I found a lot of differences. So what about these? Let me re uh, discuss them a little bit for you and then I want to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to contradictions. I've, I've really given this contradiction stuff a lot of thought recently, and I, I'm really studying it even all the more um, over the course of this last year. And I hope to be writing on it in the, in the near future. Um, I think a lot of it, we, we need to understand what a contradiction is and what constitutes a contradiction. There are what are contradictions and there are differences. They sound different, but they're compatible. Let me give you an example. I go home. Let's say I get home tomorrow afternoon and I walk in the door and my wife is just screaming with joy, not because I'm home, <laughs> but I, I walk in the door, she's screaming with joy and she says, Mike, you won't believe what happened just an hour ago. The doorbell rang, I came to the door and there's this guy at the door and he's holding this check for a, a million dollars from Publishers Clearinghouse. He says, here's a million dollars and you're going to get $5,000 a week for the rest of your life. And that's good news. Mike, you can quit your job now. This is great. We're, gonna, we're rich. This is cool. Now, let's say an hour from that point, she's talking to her mom on the phone. And she says, I hear over here, and she says, Mom, you won't believe what just happened a couple hours ago. The doorbell rang. I came down, and there are these two guys at the door. And one has this check for a million dollars. And he says, you, you know, you, you're wealthy now. And the other guy's videotaping the whole thing and saying, hey, this is great. You're going to be on a commercial on television. I wouldn't go to my wife and say, hey, wait a minute, you just contradicted what you told me an hour ago. No, there were some differences. But they weren't contradictions, were they? She didn't say, Mike, there was only one guy at the door. She only told me about one guy at the door. She was selecting the material she gave. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is a common thing that occurs in the reporting of history. Can you imagine, like, what if we were to write a, a biography of Sean McDowell? You know, his 32 years? 34. Man, cool. <laughs> Wished I'd looked like him at 34. Wished I looked like him at 20. You know, that guy makes me sick. He's just so handsome. I mean, he just, <laughs> he, he just want to make you puke, you know? Um, so, you know, what if you were to write a biography of Sean McDowell? I, I don't care if it's his dad writing it his, and, or his mom and dad writing it or a professional biographer. You're not going to be able to include all the events of his life, are you? You're going to select the things that are important to you at the time of writing or that you think may be important to your readers. Well, that's exactly what they did in antiquity. That's exactly what modern biographers do today. If anybody picks up a biography, an autobiography of Ronald Reagan and you want to know about his first marriage, you're going to be disappointed. There's only three sentences on it. Do you think there's a lot more that he could have reported? You bet. I'll bet there's some juicy stuff he could have reported too. But he chose not to. And it's the same thing with any biography. So when the, let's say when John is reporting or Matthew, Mark, and Luke are reporting Simon of Cyrene taking up Jesus' cross, but John doesn't mention it. The fact that John leaves that out doesn't mean that he's contradicting the synoptics. He didn't say Jesus carried his cross all the way. He just neglects to mention Simon of Cyrene. Is that a contradiction or a difference? It's a difference. And you think about it, I'm glad that Matthew, Mark, and Luke mentioned Simon of Cyrene, but really does it matter? that Jesus didn't carry his cross all the way? Is there any, I mean, I, I haven't heard any theological significance in that. It's an interesting datum when it comes to um, just knowing something about the past, but it's, it's really no big deal. What about the thieves on the cross? Did they both curse him like Mark say, or just one cursed him and the other said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, like Luke says? Why couldn't it be both? I mean, if these guys were thieves, uh, like, the Gospels report, I mean, they're not the kind of guys that you'd want your daughter to marry. Um, and so here they're crucified. They're both crucified. They're both thieves. And now the one guy, he's realizing he's not coming off that cross alive. He stopped buying green bananas a few days ago when he got arrested. And he sees how Jesus is patiently, patiently suffering, asking God to forgive the very people who crucified him for they didn't know what they were doing. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. A deathbed conversion. What's so hard to believe about that? So at most, if you're going to be a very careful scholar and look at it just purely academically, you could say, we possibly have a contradiction here, but very possibly not. We just can't know because there's not enough information, historically speaking. But there's just no reason to say this is a definite contradiction. And you can go through so many of the others like this. Let me just deal with one, uh, the, the people, at the, uh, the people, at the, oh, there's so many of these, they're so cool. Uh, what about Mary? John says just Mary went to the tomb. The other said it was a number of women. Well, John doesn't say just Mary went to the tomb. In fact, read the text, John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. And it says, early on the first day of the week, Mary got up and it, while it was still dark, and she went to the tomb and discovered it empty, and she ran back to Peter and the beloved disciple, and she said to them, they have taken the Lord, and we don't know where they've laid him. Who's we? You just said Mary. And John would say, I didn't say just Mary. I said Mary. I didn't mention the others. He said, well, wait a minute. That's, that's kind of weird. We don't do that today. Um, uh, could you just be making that up or that, that's just a weird anomaly or something? No, no. Go to Luke's gospel. He does the same thing. When the women come back and they tell the disciples that the tomb is empty, it says that Peter got up and ran to the tomb and found it as the women said, and then he went home baffled over what had happened. Twelve verses later, Jesus is talking to the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they don't recognize him. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he says, well, tell me what happened here. He's playing with them a little bit. Ah, oh, well, Jesus of Nazareth, is, we thought he was the Messiah. And then just this Friday, a couple days ago, he was crucified. And some of the women went to the tomb this morning, and they discovered it empty, and they saw angels, and they, they came back and told us. And then 
some of our own went to the tomb and discovered it just as the women had said. Some of our own? Wait a minute, 12 verses later, Luke, you said just Peter. And Luke says, I didn't say just Peter. I just mentioned Peter. I didn't say the others. It's like that guy who publishes clearinghouse at the front door. Well, we don't do that today. Okay, so we don't do that today. It's our responsibility in the 21st century not to judge these guys who wrote the Gospels because they didn't write according to 21st century English idiom. We have to go back as responsible students of history and understand what the idioms were in that day and how they could write as biographers in that day and judge them according to how they wrote according to the literary conventions in that day, not ours. And obviously they could do these kinds of things. Let me give you one more. This is one that kind of troubled me for a while. Why does Luke report that all of the appearances occurred in Jerusalem on Easter, including the Ascension, whereas the other Gospels tell us that it happened over a longer period of time, perhaps even weeks. Luke is using a figure, a rhetorical device called time compression. Uh, in the academic world, it's called telescoping. It's kind of like when you were a kid and you had one of those secret spy telescopes and you could pull it out with these segments and then if your mom came and saw you spying on your neighbor, you collapse it down real quick and all the segments and you hide it, right? Well, it's like, say all these segments of time and you telescope it, you collapse it down into a single segment for purposes of economy or whatever you're doing. That's a, a, a rhetorical device that they would do in order to save time or to make a point. Luke is doing this. How do we know this and that it's not a contradiction? Because Luke wrote a sequel to his gospel. It's the Acts of the Apostles. And in chapter one, he says that Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days and then ascended. So the same author realizes that it was a 40-day period that Jesus was there. So when he's saying everything happened on Easter, it's time compression. We find this throughout the other Gospels as well. Um, for example, when Mark reports Jesus cursing of the fig tree, here's what goes on. Jesus and the disciples are going into Jerusalem. Jesus is, sees the fig tree. He's hungry. There's no figs on it, so he curses it. Then they go on into Jerusalem. The next day, they're coming out of Jerusalem, and Peter and the rest of them see the fig tree. Lord, the fig tree you cursed yesterday has dried up. That's Mark's account. Read it in Matthew. There's no mention about coming into Jerusalem. In the morning, they leave Jerusalem. They're coming out, according to Matthew. Jesus is hungry, sees a fig tree, but it's got no figs on it. It doesn't have any figs on it, so he curses the tree, and immediately it dries up and withers. Whoa contradiction. Mark said he cursed it the day before and then they didn't see it till the next day. Matthew says he cursed it and immediately it dried up on the spot. Contradiction. Yeah, I guess you could say so if you're taking it in a wooden sense. But what if you take it according to the literary conventions of that day, even what we do today, and identify it as time compression? Look, how many of you are married in here? A lot of you. You all know what I'm going to say. I mean by this. You, you can all uh, identify this. There's the boy version of the story, and there's a girl version of the story. <laughs> the, the girl version of the story. You come home from work. Your wife says, I got to tell you what happened today. I got this call from Aunt Betty. Aunt Betty fell. You know, she's getting up there in age right now. She's in her 80s. She fell, and she broke her hip, and she's in the hospital right now. And it really hurt when she broke her hip. But what's hurting her more is when she was falling down, she reached out to grab herself, and the only thing she grabbed was the top of the goldfish bowl, and she pulled it down, and the goldfish bowl broke, and all the goldfish died. And you know, since Uncle Henry died a few months ago, those goldfish were the only companions she had. And now she's feeling very guilty about doing this because the very things that were her companions, um, they're dead, and she was responsible for it. And so now, in addition to feeling physical pain, she's feeling emotional pain, and it's really hurting her. And it really makes me feel bad because she's feeling bad. And, well, how do you feel about this? That's the girl version. Now the guy version is Aunt Betty fell and broke her hip. 
what's for dinner tonight? Okay. Us guys, listen, I'm not saying our way's better. It just depends context. The difference is we want bottom line, just tell us in two or three or four bullet points and get to the bottom line. I don't need all of those details. Okay? Um, that's the difference. Now, a lot of times when we're reading the gospel, sometimes we're reading the boy version. Sometimes we're reading the girl version. Matthew is saying in this text, look, I know Mark told about this. They were coming out of, or going into Jerusalem. They, Jesus was hungry. He saw the tree, no figs, he cursed it. And then they went into Jerusalem. The next day they came out of Jerusalem. They saw the, Matthew is saying, come on, I don't need all these. Mark, you've been a little effeminate anyway. I've been wondering about you. You know, listen, he was driving a chariot that looked a lot like a minivan. So Matthew was questioning Mark on this. Matthew said, let's just get to the bottom line. Let's get to the bottom line. Jesus saw a fig tree, he wanted some figs, none were on it, he cursed it, it dried up, period. Miracle happened, okay? And then Jesus makes the point out of it. Matthew wants to get straight to the point. Forget the details. Now, if we look at it as a student of history, fantastic. I like the details, the more the better. But when you're a biographer writing in the first century and you're writing out of space because you, got, you have no more than 25,000 words that you can fit on that single scroll, and that's about the size of a biography. It was supposed to be able to be read at a dinner or in front of audiences and take you about an hour and a half. So you can't go over 25,000 words. Matthew is one of the longest gospels. He doesn't have time to report all these things. It just wasn't as, as important to him. Maybe he'd rather cover the story of Simon of Cyrene and. John says, no, I don't need that. I want something else in here, the raising of Lazarus. They're just selecting the things they do. Look, we could go over so many of these different things, but contradictions, I, I just don't see that there are any like that, that we can definitely identify as a contradiction in the Gospels. Let me say one other thing about contradictions. Even if there were, what difference really is this going to make to us in assessing the life of Jesus? 19, uh, 1912, the Titanic sank. More than half the people died on board. But the survivors had contradictory testimonies on a peripheral detail. Some said that the ship broke in two just prior to sinking. Others said, nah, -uh, she went down intact. How do you get something like that wrong? You're out there, it's the most terrifying night of your life. There's only one thing you can see in the water. It's a little over 800 feet long and it's all lit up. And just so you don't miss it, there's a bunch of screams coming from it as well as you're on there. You're seeing loved ones, family, uh, family members, friends, colleagues that are dying before your very eyes. How do you get it messed up uh, that whether it broke in two and then it sank or that no, it went down in one piece? I don't know. But no one turned around and concluded and said, well, I guess we need to keep looking for the ship. It must not have sank. These guys can't get it right. No, they said, all right, they agree on certain core details. And the ones on which they don't agree, I guess we just don't know about the peripheral details. What if my explanation of whether there was one or two angels is mistaken? Whether there was Mary just gone to the tomb or several of them, what difference does it make? They still all agree that some female, at least a female, went to the tomb, discovered it empty, saw an angel, at least one angel, and who had said that Jesus wasn't alive, that, or wasn't dead. He had been raised from the dead and was now alive. They all report appearances. So there are some core details that we can get to in them. Contradictions really don't discredit the accounts. Let me say one other thing before I move on. There are many accounts in antiquity where contradictions exist. If you look at the famous burning of Rome that started on July 18th in the year 64, there are three primary sources we have that describe it. There's uh, Suetonius, Tacitus, and Dio Cassius, none of whom were eyewitnesses of the event, and they all contradict on certain details. Did Nero openly recruit thugs to torch the city, as one author says, or did he do it in secretly, as another author says, or was he not involved at all, as, or, as Tacitus says? Depends who you read. Um, where was Nero when he watched the city ablaze? Was he at the palace, his palace rooftop? Or was he at the Tower of Machenus? 
or was he th at 35 miles away in the city of Antium? Depends who you read. So maybe we don't know the truth of where he was or his involvement. We can't figure that out historically, but no one denies that Rome burned. We know it did. So it only calls into question some of the peripheral details. All right, dating. When were the Gospels written? Ehrman complains that the Gospels were written 35 to 65 years after the events they purport to describe, and this is too long after the events in order to be reliable. Now, the standard dating of the Gospels uh, offered by scholars today is 35 to 65 years after Jesus. Most scholars will place Mark as the first Gospel, written between 65 and 70, or 35 to 40 years after Jesus, Matthew next around the year 80, Luke in 85, and John somewhere between 90 and 95 AD, or 60 to 65 years after Jesus' crucifixion. Now, most scholars will also admit that we really don't have any firm um, ways of dating them to this period. This is guessing. Um, almost, almost all scholars will place the Gospels within the first century, but that's about all we can get at for, for certain in the first century. But I'm, so there, I know there are earlier datings for the Gospels, I, I, I'm, so, and, and I'm partial to some of those myself, um, but it really doesn't matter. So I'm just going with the standard dating as Ehrman is here, 35 to 65 years later. And he says that this is equivalent to the time between World War II and today, and so it's just too late. Really? Do we have any World War II vets in this room? Yes, sir. Any others? Yep, nope, nope. Okay, I see something. There we go. Yes, sir. Hey, thank you so much for what you did for us. Okay, now let me ask you guys something. Do you remember World War II? Huh? Somewhat. Okay, how about you? Yes. Okay, now, it's possible that maybe you conflate two battles together or something. You might mess up on some of the details, but I'll bet you remember some of your time overseas pretty well. Um, if Ehrman really believes this, I think he ought to call up the History Channel and say, Stop! Don't do these documentaries anymore on World War II and interview these vets today. It was just too long. These guys really don't know what they're talking about. Of course he wouldn't do that. And when we're talking World War II, that's John's gospel. Mark's the earliest, 35 to 40 years. Now we're not talking about World War II, we're talking about Vietnam. Any Vietnam vets in here? Wow, quite a few of you. You guys, thank you so much for what you did. How about Korea, any Korea? Korean vets. All right, thank you. Appreciate all our veterans. You guys from Vietnam, I'm mentioning you because you're the closest uh, and you're around the time of Mark's writing. Do you guys remember Vietnam? I, I know the Agent Orange and marijuana and stuff of that day, but do you remember? <laughs> yeah, man, I remember. Do you remember Vietnam? I, I, do you remember it really well? I mean, yeah. Stuff like that, you're going to remember big things in your life that leave such an impression you're going to remember. Now listen, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't remember what I had for dinner three nights ago. No big deal though, right? But you know, I can tell you about the very first Major League Baseball game I went to. I lived in Baltimore. It was July 9th, 1971. We played uh, the Orioles. This is the great team with, with Brooks Robinson and Jim Palmer and all those guys. They, want, they went to the World Series that year. But that particular night, we played the Cleveland Indians. We beat them four to one. Jim Palmer was pitching. Uh, the guy that scored the one run for the Indians, he hit a home run. And uh, Mark Belanger, the shortstop for the Orioles, caught the last out on a pop fly. My grandfather and I were sitting in the mezzanine seats on the first base side. It was really a cool night. I remember some of the souvenirs I got at the game. I still have them. Now, why do I remember all those goofy details? Because that was a big event in my life. That was 40 years ago. And yet I can't remember what I had for breakfast or dinner three nights ago. The big things I can remember, things, you think it, they see Jesus walking on water, <laughs> cursing, a, drying up a fig tree, rising from the dead, they're not going to remember that? 
Whoa, I mean, of course you're going to. So that's not too long. Caesar Augustus is the Roman emperor at the time of Jesus' birth. He's regarded as the best of all the Roman, uh, Roman emperors. And we have six primary sources uh, that historians go to to find out about uh, uh, significant details about the life of Augustus. The first, or the, the earliest, is a funerary inscription less than 4,000 words written at the time of Augustus' death. The other five were all written 90 to 200 years later. And yet, we feel like we get some pretty good information about Augustus. With Jesus, we've got all this information, four biographies of Jesus written within 35 to 65 years. Don't tell me that's not good information. That's excellent information. Finally, eyewitnesses. Ehrman complains, he says, the Gospels weren't written by eyewitnesses. They got corrupted over time. We've all played the game of telephone, right? I whisper something in your ear, I whisper something in your ear, I tell you to whisper it to the people next to you, and you go all the way around, and by the time we get to the back of this room an hour later, it's two corrupted sentences, right? And if that can happen in this one room in one hour, then what happens in the 35 years between when the events happened and when they get reported in the Gospels. The game of telephone. Well, I think that there's a better analogy for this, and that's instead of the game of telephone, it's martial arts. How many of you are martial artists in here? You've trained in martial arts or something. All right, bunch of you. I, I trained in the art of Taekwondo for many years. Um, I started in 1983. Uh, continued up until the 90s, uh, late 90s when I blew out a disc in my back. Um, I was an instructor for several years. I learned from a guy named Master Un Sang Ki, who was an eighth degree black belt, who learned from a guy named General Che Hun Hee, who was the founder of Taekwondo in 1955. So in the martial arts, whether it's Taekwondo or, or a Japanese form or a Chinese form or, or a Thai form, whatever it is, you learn these forms that could be called katas or huns or whatever they're called in your particular art. But you learn these sequence of moves, blocks and punches and kicks, and you learn these sequences so that you can perfect these techniques. And you learn these to pass down from generation to generation, instructor to student. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? And um, so work on your forms, all right? Instructor to student, instructor to student, instructor to student. And this goes on for hundreds of years. A student would never even think of changing the form and say, ah, oh, that's, a, that's a boring form. Let's spice this thing up and, and change it. No, because you learn discipline. You learn respect in the martial arts. It's the pride that you're getting what was invented hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, that you have the same thing. You're doing the same moves they did. For me, Taekwondo was a relatively new martial art. I'm learning it in 83. It was invented 28 years earlier. So when my instructor, Master Un, is passing it to me, I, he could say, Mike, I'm delivering to you what I also received from the founder. Now that's pretty reliable, isn't it? You got Paul, who in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 says, hey, I'm del I delivered to you, Corinthians, what I had also received. And he delivered it to them around the year 51 when he was setting up the First Baptist Church in Corinth. <laughs> So that's when he's given it to them. Um, and so he's given them reliable information. Well, how do we know that Paul's telling the truth about what he delivered to them, that that's what he received? How do you know he wasn't lying about that? He's just making this thing up and saying, I received it from others in order to make it credible. Really glad you asked that question. You see, throughout Paul's letters, he talks about tradition. And being a former Pharisee, they were really into tradition. In fact, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because they gave more priority to the, the, the tradition over the scriptures. And Paul's passing all this tradition that he had received and told people they needed to listen to this. If someone stopped listening and following the tradition, that they were to be, um, you wouldn't, weren't even to associate with such a person. So again, how do we know Paul wasn't just making this up and putting all this authority in the tradition he'd made up? Because we can test him on the matter. And this is where you can really blow someone away that says Paul invented Christianity. It's ridiculous to say that. It's without foundation. Why? First of all, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul says he met with the Jerusalem pillars, Peter, James, and John, ran the gospel past them to make sure he's preaching what they were preaching, and he said, you're good, Paul. You're, you're, you're right on with it. Keep up the good work, brother. All right, yeah, but Mike, that's Paul saying that. All right, let's go to Clement of Rome and Polycarp. These were two guys who were probably discipled by Peter and John, respectively, two of the Jerusalem pillars. 
So now, Paul's been dead for a couple decades. Clement of Rome and First Clement, Polycarp in his letter to the Philippians, it's really interesting to see what they say of Paul. Because if Paul was teaching differently than their mentors, Peter and John, we'd expect them to rebuke Paul for it, right? Especially since Paul's dead, he can't come back at him <laughs> and write my letter against Polycarp and Clement, those heretics. What Clement says, he says, and I quote, Paul accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. And he puts Paul on par with his mentor, Peter. When you come to Polycarp, he refers to the blessed Paul. He quotes from Paul's writings and refers to them as part of the sacred scriptures. Do you think Paul was teaching what Peter and John were teaching? Well, from those who knew Peter and John and followed them, you bet. We can test it, Paul, too. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul is talking about the marriage and divorce. Three questions. Question number one, Paul, I'm single. Can I get married? He says, yeah, you can get married. Go for it if you want. But let me tell you, if you remain single like I'm single, he says, there's benefits to this because you don't have to worry about your spouse. You can give more emotional and energy and financial resources and time resources to serving the kingdom of Christ. So there's advantages to remaining single, but if you want to get married, go for it. This is my opinion, he says. Paul, second question. I'm married, can I get divorced? And Paul says, hey, not I, but the Lord. This is what the Lord says, and he quotes the Jesus tradition that he's received. He, didn't hear, he wasn't there sitting at Jesus' feet and getting the teaching, so he says, not I, but the Lord. Okay, this is what Jesus said. He's going to repeat the Jesus tradition, and he talks about marriage and divorce, just like Matthew and Mark have Jesus saying, no, unless your spouse cheats on you, you can't get divorced and be in the will of God. All right, Paul, third question. I'm married to a non-believer. Can I get divorced? Can I divorce them? And then Paul makes that really strange statement that's probably troubled most of us in this room. Not the Lord, but I. Well, what does he mean by that? He's saying, hey, you're not reading the red letter edition now. This isn't the inspired and errant word of God I'm giving you here. This is my thought. So just, you know, you don't need to, to listen to me here if you, no, that's not what he's saying. When he says, not the Lord, but I, he's saying, listen, I don't have any Jesus tradition to draw from because there was no church when Jesus was alive. He didn't have to deal, everybody was practically a non-believer at that point. We're in a different situation right now, so let me give you my ruling on this. He says, if you're married to a non-believer and they want to leave, let them leave. But if they want to stay with you, stay uh, married to them. And then he adds, this is my command, and you are to pass it along to the other churches. So in essence, what he's saying is, he's given us here opinion, the Jesus tradition, and he says, okay, this isn't Jesus tradition, but it's binding on you just like the Jesus tradition would be. What's cool about this, though, is we can see Paul in action. He refused to commingle the two. He refused to do what many skeptics say Paul did, was to take the situations and make up words, put them in the lips of Jesus in order to address situations that Jesus really hadn't commented on. No, Paul refused to do that, and we can test him on it. So when we are getting tradition from Paul, we are hearing the voice of the Jerusalem apostles. We are indeed hearing the voice of Jesus on the matter. We are getting eyewitness testimony. So, wrap this up. I said the ABCs, Ds, and Es of defending the Gospels, authorship, bias, contradictions, dating, and eyewitness. Finally, if you want to uh, get more information on this, go to our website, fortruth.net. If you want to, uh, let's say you weren't taking notes on this and you want to hear it again, uh, of course, they're selling uh, CDs or DVDs here, but you can also... Um, See, there's a four-part video series that we created and put on the fortruth.net website, fortruth.net forward slash ermin. You can even use this for small groups. There's a document on there that you can download. It's all free, and you can do this at, for small groups with the discussion questions. And if any of you are on Twitter, feel, feel, feel free to follow me at Did Jesus Rise. Thank you very much. Let's go out, kick butt, and take names for Jesus.